Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about historical fiction and mythology. We have for you an interview with Amalia Dillon, an old online friend of mine who is an author and a lover of the ancient world in various forms. Amalia Dillon began as a biology major before taking Latin and falling in love with old heroes and older gods. After that, she couldn't stop writing about them, with the occasional break for more contemporary subjects. Amalia is the author of The Fate of the Gods trilogy about Eve and Adam, and Thor and Athena and more, and the Orc saga beginning with Honor Among Orcs. She also writes as Amalia Caracella about Bronze Age Greece, Helen of Sparta and sequels which are about the love between Helen and Theseus, and also about the Viking Age. Daughter of a Thousand Years is a book about Freydis, the daughter of Eric the Red, and a modern woman wrestling with her newly found pagan faith. We spoke to Amalia before the holidays about her love of mythology, the complexities of writing historical fiction, and goats. So, welcome Amalia. Thank you. So glad to have you here. <laughs> Excited to be here. <laughs> so, before we get started, we have a very important piece of business, which is talking about what we're drinking. Of course. Because all of our episodes have to start that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, in honor of some of what we're going to be talking about tonight, <laughs> I'm sure, we have on both ends of this, I believe, mm -hmm. we are drinking mead. Yes. Indeed. So, Mark, what are we drinking? So, we're drinking Rosewood Estate Winery uh, Mead Royale, which is a barrel-aged mead uh, bottled in uh, 2015. Hmm. Which just was on our shelf, and uh, I didn't want to drink our homemade mead. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't approve of it. Uh, <laughs> Mark likes it. It's good. It just needed to be... Well aged. Yeah, it did need to be aged 15 years, and it's just, it is starting to be, be drinkable now. That's, sometimes it takes time. Yeah. <laughs> so, and uh, what about you? I am drinking a local, it's called Helderberg Meadworks Odin's Tears, Ooh. and it's an unoaked dry mead. Oh. All right. Well, wassail, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Hmm. It's quite sweet. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, it is nice. It has a little bit of that taste I don't like in ours, but it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really the biggest meat fan, I must say. But We should have good. been having these in our drinking horns. Oh, oh I have I'm a horn, sorry, too. I missed the opportunity. I forgot about that. <laughs> the problem is you can't put them down. So yeah, you have yeah. to drink it in one draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which might be entertaining, but might do poor things to the quality of the <laughs> end of this podcast anyway. pluses and minuses <laughs> deterioration and quality might be, might be noticed. <laughs> all right and how's yours it's delicious uh, i always think that i don't really enjoy the oakiness of the their regular mead and then i get right. the unoaked and then i'm like oh i really miss the oak <laughs> note but it, i i i feel like i need to just get a bottle of both and then mix them together one of these days right you need a half oaked or something yes yeah. yeah i'm a bit like that with chardonnay i don't like oak chardonnay but then whenever i have a chardonnay right like we, we make them without oak it's always a little flat and i'm like yeah. ah, i guess there is a reason why they add the oak I yeah i don't like it very much so yeah like a well so the reason of course that mead is appropriate is because of one of the one of your areas of interest, shall we say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so why don't <laughs> you have you have several areas of interest? Yeah. I'd say, but the mead-related one does seem fairly prominent. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not mead itself, you understand? But <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> so overall. Obviously, we want to talk to you tonight about your writing, but also about just your general interest in the sorts of things we're interested in. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can start with what the origin of your interest in myth and in history and in these particular periods of Bronze Age Greece or Bronze Age Mediterranean and uh, Norse myth. So where does that where did that start? Where did it come from for you? 
I think that my love of mythology generally was inspired by my mother and my oldest brother. My mother always encouraged us to like she loved she loved the myths. She loved classical mythology, she loved Egyptian mythology, she loved ancient history. So there was always a lot of that passion in my house. And my brother actually went to school and came home. He's 11 years older than me. So he came home from school and he was like my hero. And he had Bullfinch's mythology and he would read me about it, read to me from Bullfinch's. And I just, Ah, you know, sucked it all up like a sponge and thought it was the greatest thing ever. And then, of course, because he was my hero, I wanted to pursue and learn more about it just because he loved it. So that's, I think, where it began and then I, I put it down for a while and only came back to it again when I started taking Latin in college. Right. After having, um, no, I'm not, I was going to say misguidedly, but that's <laughs> mean and not correct. <laughs> started in biology. Or yeah, wildlife <laughs> biology. Yeah, I wanted to be a tiger zookeeper. Okay, that's not yeah. <laughs> That's a completely reasonable yeah. name. In it life. sounded like the be best job ever. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but then so I I took Latin initially because I wanted it to help me with the naming. I figured if I had Latin that it would help me with the scientific naming and the scientific everything else. Right. And then I just realized, you know what? I really love this a lot more than the science classes. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how we get you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I mean I still enjoyed my science classes, but then I realized if I was going to do wildlife biology, I would have to give up all of the other things that I loved because it was such an intense program. So I just I was like, if I do if I do wildlife, I'm going to hate myself, but if I do classics, I'm going to really love it. So. Mm. That's where I went. And it helped that I found out I was allergic to tigers, too. It kind of <laughs> steered me. Like, oh, I remember that story. <laughs> I remember that story. Yeah. Either. yeah. <laughs> of all the bizarre, like, I, I could not tell you if I'm allergic to tigers because I have never been yeah. that yeah. close to a tiger. How would you know, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You take your life into your own hands and that's how you find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> First, first, find your tiger. (laughs) (laughs) And then let it almost bite you. Yes. Mm. And then if you sneeze, you definitely know that's not for you. (laughs) Then you know. Though, are you sure it's not, you know, like uh, people who walk out in the sun and sneeze from the bright lights? Maybe it was just sort of a fear reflex. Oh, it was really, really allergic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No mistaking the symptoms. Which was, but not cat. No, just tiger. Like that tiger, I, it was beautiful. It was so friendly. I could have snuggled it for the whole rest of the night. But then, like my eyes started watering, my like my head filled up, and I just like could barely breathe. So mm-hmm. that was pretty much that. So classics, it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a great choice. <laughs> yeah, the obvious alternative yes. to tigers, it absolutely is. was. <laughs> Yep. Well, I mean, they had lions in Europe, so, you know, it's almost the same. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So you changed to classics and and English, and then obviously that is a a combination that has served you well in what you're doing now. Yes. I always knew that I wanted to write, but um, I didn't realize what I would be writing about, I think. Mm -hmm. And once I started writing about mythology, it was really hard to stop. So (laughs) here I am. There's certainly a lot of scope there. Yeah. A lot of stories around the edges that kind of get forgotten that you can bring back to life. And that's, I think, my favorite part of it. Mm -hmm. Rather than focusing on the ones that are told the most. Yeah. I like to find the little nugget, like the little one line that's almost an afterthought and then build it back up into its own Mm. world. Right. Right. And so that's what draws you to writing about it. So like... I understand why one loves me. I mean, I, I had the same experience when I was quite young. It was definitely what drew me into classics as well. But writing about it is different than just, you know, reading it and loving it. Yeah. It's that. So it's the exploring the parts that, uh, that have gaps in them. Is that what you like? Exploring the stories that aren't told in detail and kind of discovering mm-hmm. the truth of that myth for myself. For me, it feels kind of like 
I'm digging like an archaeologist, like looking for the truth mm. and the bones of the story and what the meaning beneath it all could have been and how it could have come to be. And, and I'm lo- like, I feel like I'm looking for the truth. And uh, I mean, of course, myth can often be quite sparse. Yes. So there are those, you know, often those those big gaps that uh, you you have to, you know, fill in somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I guess my my, um, my one of the questions I've I've wanted to ask you was in writing about Beth. So, just for those who haven't had the pleasure yet, um, you know, in particularly thinking of the Helen stories, mm-hmm. but also some of the other other things you've written. Not so much the the fantasy with you know Eve mm-hmm. and Adam and Eve and those because there you have really all the scope you need you can you started with a story and then you can go back and forth but basically you're not working within the confines of a story for very long but when you were working with Helen my big question for you is how do you write a story that is in any way coherent in terms of motivations and human sort of plausibility Mm -hmm. when you're working with this material that sort of by its nature often is really completely implausible. And I don't mean, you know, bullheaded men and things like that. I mean, why people do the things they do. Yeah. The, the you know, there's, there's so little logic in a sort of straightforward way to why people act the way they do in myth. Oh, and also the contradictions between one mm-hmm. story and the next, between one writer and the next mm-hmm. of who was doing what. It's it really a jigsaw of fitting things together in a way that makes sense. And I think for me, it started with just understanding who Helen was and then also exploring Theseus, who he kind of, I didn't really mean to tell, to write a book about Helen and Theseus when I started it, mm. uh, but he, he just came to life. And then I knew that that was that that was going to be the story. The heart of the story was going to be Helen and Theseus instead of going through the whole of Helen's life. So Mm -hmm. it is, it is hard to make sense of it and to make it coherent. But I feel that once you Mm -hmm. get a hold of the characters as people, once they come to life, they kind of dictate how things happen because they can only Mm -hmm. do their character only allows for them to do one thing in any given moment. Right. I guess um, the thing that, because uh, I remember having conversations with you, I think several years ago now, probably while you were writing the Helen mm-hmm. stuff, where you would sort of come on, when I say conversations, I mean, of course, Twitter. <laughs> I always mean Twitter when I say conversations. I don't speak to people in real life. It's overrated. Um, <laughs> but uh, where you'd, you'd come on and sort of be like, why would, why would, Theseus, or why would someone do this? Like, why would he do this action, or why would this god do that? Mm-hmm. And and I, with my sort of interpreting myth hat on, would be like, well, but you know, it's because it's it's really speaking to the the fear of the unwed maiden in <laughs> culture, or it's you know, or whatever. And you'd be like, yes, but like, why would he do that? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to figure out why he would do this. And I'd be, and we kind of had these, I mean, it was almost very fun and it was, they were mm-hmm. interesting conversations, but in some ways we were kind of talking past each other Yeah, because you were talking about why would a person, an yes. actual person do these things? Yes. And I was saying, well, but they aren't real, you know, they aren't people. They don't act like logical. They, not that humans are logical, but you understand they don't act according to human logic. They, they function in this, you know, in a symbolic way or whatever that makes sense. You know, why does Theseus abandon Ariadne? There's nothing in the myths to that make any sense of yeah. that. Like, the, literally the only reason it makes sense is if it's thematically resonant with the fact that he forgets everything. <laughs> Right. Well, like he I guess to change the sales like in, 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 in sort of in, in a bare bones telling of the story. Yeah, I, I would say that it makes sense if a god came down and told him you yes. have to leave her. <laughs> yeah, but in fact, in fact, we don't even have that in the story. I'm just thinking about the, the actual. Yeah. The actual version insofar as we have that story told in any detail. None of the stories like even Catullus doesn't give that as an example. He just says he forgot. Right. And then he has her railing against him forgetting. And it makes poetic sense, but it doesn't make a lot of <laughs> logical sense. Now, the, all of that's to say, you then went on and, and did it. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
I think you made very believable characters out of it, and and I, I, I commend you for it. But it was, I, I find like that was what I found really interesting about how you approached these stories was that you were always looking for a human narrative there. Yes. It seems to be almost not perverse, sorry, but like you're working with material that almost by its nature is not going to be logical in that sense. Mm -hmm. So you've set yourself quite a challenge. (laughs) But it's fun. I like, it's fun (laughs) to think about why, like to, to invent or, or dig for a reason why a person mm-hmm. would do X, Y, or Z in the myths. And I think mm-hmm. for me, a lot of it comes down to like, this is necessary for them to have done this or they did this because there was something else that we like don't have an understanding of. Right. Or uh, like the retellings of of the Iliad. One of the things that makes me crazy is Mm -hmm. when people pull the gods out of the narrative. Because to me, the Iliad doesn't make any sense at all if you pull the gods out of the story. Because no, like there are no, there's no motivation for anybody to be doing anything once the gods are removed. exactly. Well, so that's what I was going to say is in your search for sort of putting it into some kinds of coherence. And and I mean by that, like um, emotional coherence. I I understand the problem of of multiple versions too, Mm -hmm. but I mean... There, you can essentially pick and choose. That's a time-honored approach. <laughs> to, yeah, yes. To work for you and, and leave the bits you don't like Still out. Still in use to this day. <laughs> yes. And one I, I have no, I mean, I have no problem with, at least theoretically, even when people do strange things to the <laughs> But But I, I'm totally with you on that. Um, but then, do you sort of have parameters for yourself in terms of how much you're willing to is it about not altering what's there but filling in the gaps or how much do you feel like you can sort of fudge the received stories in order to try to fit them into a a sort of the the story your characters want to be part of for me the thing that i don't the thing that i try to stay truest to is the character as i Mm. have discovered them so helen i wanted helen to be more active and really a fully formed human being who cares about people and not who isn't just a pawn. And, and once I discovered Helen's character in that way, then I knew how, like, that was the most important thing to me in the story. It wasn't how Mm -hmm. the myths tell us that Helen acted that mattered less than Helen being Helen and Theseus being Theseus and that's really in terms of the myth. that's really what it came down to for me and and I think that's what it comes down to like in every story that I tell is staying true to the individual characters above all else and if that means departing from the mythology or choosing a branch that makes less sense to the readership then I'm mm. going to do it <laughs> <laughs> I really think oh, yeah, I really no, think I'd... staying true to the core like I feel like there's a core element of of these myths that's what like resonates mm-hmm. and that's the that's the string I'm pulling on more than the actual facts or details of the stories themselves. Right. And I, like and I don't really know how to explain what it <laughs> I don't really know how to explain what it no, is. No, more. that's a, no, that's a that's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, but that's, I mean, that's what I wanted to know. Like, you know, there's two ways essentially of approaching it. That's probably more than two, but one is as you've described. And then the other would be to say, you know, the challenge I've set myself is here are what the facts are. Facts. I mean, obviously that's a not quite the right word, but you know what I mean? Here's the sort of bones of the story as in, uh, is told in Apollodorus or told in whatever Mm -hmm. source. And I'm going to, you know, not alter those and then do whatever I want between them. I don't think there's anything wrong with either of those approaches. I'm just curious to, you know, which, which was your sort of mental And I feel approach. that, and I feel it at its heart, mythology is meant to be retold. So I don't, I mean, we can see in, in the ancient writers that they, they were retelling these stories and changing the details and moving things around mm-hmm. as they yeah. saw fit. And I think if they can do it or they felt that it was important to do it, that kind of sets for me it gives me permission maybe to also feel that yeah i can do it too because the more important thing is to keep the story relevant and allow people to engage with it 
Right. To change it for right. the context mm-hmm. it's being told in. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that's absolutely fundamental to, you know, that kind of traditional narrative is that it does get retold over right. and over again in, you know, in changes and new themes are brought out or, you know, bits are left out right. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and and in particular, one of the one of the constraints on how a story is retold very much in the ancient world was always genre. So on that note, I sort of feel like you set yourself almost the hardest task in terms of this kind of emotional coherence by choosing to write romance. <laughs> is that what I'm writing? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's romance in the sense that uh, it, it's closer to romance than it is to say an adventure yes, story yes. or a Absolutely. war narrative yes. or right. So um, whatever else romance is or however close you are to it, it's very centered on emotions yes. and relationships. Yes. Right. And your writing is definitely centered on emotions and relationships. Absolutely. Uh, no, I mean, I, I'm uh, in no position to judge the barriers of genres uh, <laughs> in, in modern genres. I'm, I'm really good at ancient ones. But, <laughs> but if, if, you would, if you would do me the favor of choosing one poetic meter and sticking to it, I would have a much better idea of what genre you were writing in. <laughs> it would really make it much simpler, and I don't understand why you won't do me that courtesy. <laughs> and if it were elegiac couplets, I'd know what you were writing <laughs> The tricky thing is that in the modern context, romance, the only way that a book is a romance is if it has a happily ever after. And I find (laughs) that I end up writing tragic endings. (laughs) And if it isn't ending happily, it isn't. And then nobody knows what to do with my book. (laughs) Right, And that's and that's a that's a not purely a marketing thing, but I mean, uh, it, in terms of the reason it matters what your genre right. is, is because of how it's to whom it's sold right. and what the audience right. is. Right. Yeah. The, what genre it is doesn't matter in terms of whether it's a good book or not, but I totally understand why it matters from the perspective of people f- figuring out whether they want to read it or not. Yes. Yeah. It's tricky. <laughs> it is a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and I mean, realistically that is actually that is tied to the fact that you've chosen to write about right. myth because myth doesn't as a rule have happy right. endings and goodness knows women in myth never get happy endings. No. except helen does get a happy ending <laughs> you just decided not to give it to her <laughs> just for the record I, spoilers here hey but. i <laughs> <laughs> she's the only woman in all of the myth that gets a happy ending well penelope's not too badly off penelope oh well, it depends how far you go in odyssey she doesn't <laughs> keep going with her myth she the, things go a little tragically wrong again but yes I, helen ends up in like fields of elysium mm. who's to say she doesn't I mean, still Ages. end up in the fields of elysium <laughs> Sure. I don't want to give things away. <laughs> but I, I do think that's kind of funny. That <laughs> As a rule, myth is certainly not a happy endings. It's not about happy endings, though. So I can see why that's a problem in, in generic terms for you. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, romance or what or quasi romance or whatever we decide you're writing is very much, you, you know, you've, you've chosen something that's very much about how people mm-hmm. relate and the sort of emotional truth mm-hmm. of their their lives whereas if it were a an adventure story or you know something more like the movie Troy yeah. or something, <laughs> uh, you know people can do things for selfish reasons or for sort of inexplicable reasons and as long as the plot and the the adventure bits mm-hmm. work you don't have to interrogate too closely why they why they except do except that things i still do as the person who's watching yeah. it so <laughs> yeah. i think that that like that's what appeals to me as far as a consumer of media mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. story. And like, I love, I care very much about relationships between people and, mm-hmm. and how they're engaging with one another. And, and, and I find that problematic in like, it, I, I don't really enjoy a lot of like action movies or action mm-hmm. books because I'm like, what, but there's no, there's no substance where's the where's the where's the connection where's the emotion i want to care yeah yeah so i think that that's part of why i write the myths from the direction that i do because Mm -hmm. that's that's what i care about yeah and because i think the thing 
sometimes I think that is what's missing in Mm -hmm. the myths as they're retold, not necessarily in all of the versions from the ancient world of them, but in the, when they're retold in the kind of compendia, like Bullfinches or I read Robert Graves or whatever, they are told as a series of events and there isn't a lot of emotional connection. You know, when, I don't know, um, Anacreon is torn apart by his dogs, it's sort of like horrible, but we never cared about who he was anyway, because we never really right. got to know him. He was just a name of a person who one day yep. went hunting and maybe we got his genealogy and that was it. So, you know, there's the, the, the versions they're told in tend to be sort of fairy tale like mm-hmm. in that way of not having a lot of, of substance to them. And, and I think that that's true. I mean, in the, in the Norse Icelandic sagas and mm-hmm. the Viking romances that it's very much the same kind of, mm-hmm. In the saga of the Volsungs, you have these passages where it's, and then Sigurd went and fought and came back rich. And you're, <laughs> and you're like, all right, that could have been a book. Like, wh- who was he? What happened? We, did, we don't, we're never going to know. Why was he? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even in the historical sagas, mm-hmm. to be honest, there's, um, I mean, sometimes there's a lot of characterization, but there's a lot of times in reading the historical Iceland. Yes. Icelandic sagas found where people just do things. It's very and, yes. exterior. Yeah. You don't get their interior monologue mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And every so often somebody will say, why yeah. are you doing this? And then the person will say something <laughs> enigmatic yeah. and yeah. slightly yeah. joking <laughs> about, you know, wanting to kill yeah. horses or something. I mean, like it, like something completely that doesn't really because my axe is bigger yeah. than yours or something. <laughs> and you're like, OK, <laughs> yeah burn someone alive in a house. Right. And, and we have this problem also with, with history, like the way that history is taught mm-hmm. generally. Cause I, I remember being in high school and I really did not care about anything that I was being taught in history mm-hmm. because it was just names and dates and battles. And you never got to understand the interior of any important player in, in the story. And I feel like that's really missing, like, um, it cheats us because we really should have an understanding and, and be able to identify with and understand the motivations on a personal level of people like in America, in the United States, the founding fathers. I mean, not giving us that context of who they were as people is, is terrible. (laughs) <laughs> it just it strips all yeah. of the uh, joy out of it i don't know if that's the right mm. word either but connection humanity well sometimes it's joy i think yeah mm-hmm. and yeah and then it's, it, it's as if the past becomes right. a series of events but the present is this rich right. tapestry of emotions and that makes us feel like the past is a different place they like, get like things that happened in the past are divorced are not connected to the way things happen now because they don't feel like they happen for the same right there's no understanding that people were people in the past just like they're people today and i mean the the culture changes and what's acceptable maybe changes although i think that there are always people in every generation in every area where develop a sense of the sanctity of life or the sanctity of humanity. And I don't think that that's something that's restricted to just the modern world, although it's much more common now. So mm-hmm. I feel like connecting back into that idea that the people in the past were people and had relationships mm-hmm. and loved and feared and and chased after the things that they were passionate about that is incredibly important for us to understand where we fit in the world. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's, you know, one of the, that's not the only, but one of the major attractions of Mm -hmm. historical fiction for anyone who does love the past or who comes to the past through historical fiction, you know, as their, as their gateway drag. (laughs) Because, Because it is a sort of a, a promise or a it's not quite a, it's a slightly illusory promise but a hope that you can sort of try to understand people in the past i mean the problem is it is fiction because right. we can never 
know the brains, the minds of the people who don't leave us the evidence. Right. But we can make guesses. And even if those guesses are not in themselves provable or accurate or whatever, it helps us remember that, you know, these may not have been the motivations, but there were motivations. Yeah. There were reasons and there were complicated people making these decisions. Right. To do the various things that happened. And so even if it's a what if rather than uh, this is it version, it's still a, a compelling thing. If it allows us in the modern world to transport ourselves even for a moment into the shoes of someone in the past, I think that mm. that is the most important thing and the, the greatest gift that we can give ourselves. Mm-hmm. So how did you come to Norse myth and history? Because it's, I mean, it's certainly not as well known as Greek myth, for instance. And it's, I find it rare to find, you know, people who know very much about it outside of, you know, Thor and Marvel comics or something like that. This is harder to answer. I, I always had an awareness of Thor, uh, comic book Thor, because my cousin was obsessed with Thor in the comics and he still really loves Thor and reads Thor and calls me up and we talk about what's happening in the Thor Thor comic and I get angry and remember why I'm not reading it anymore (laughs) Um, and then (laughs) it kind of grew out from there I went to school in North Dakota the University of North Dakota and I don't know how many people realize how Scandinavian North Dakota Mm -hmm. and Minnesota are but it is intensely Scandinavian and the University of North Mm -hmm. Dakota actually had um, a program like a sister program in Norway so there was a lot of cross pollination I guess where you had a lot of people who went to Norway and studied abroad and Norwegians came and went to school with us Uh, and I had a like I took a class on Norse mythology in college which was questionably helpful (laughs) i I took a class on tolkien (laughs) which of course when when you do any kind of in-depth study of tolkien you have you're exposed to norse myth and the sagas Mm -hmm. and all of that kind of came together with with my knowledge of comic book thor and i really and and the more that i learned about the norse myths and uh, like I kind of loved comic book Thor more, and then some. Then I like made the switch. So <laughs> I don't. I don't know how. Like where the breaking point was, <laughs> but at some point, um, then I learned to love Thor for Thor, and and mm-hmm. of course because I'm I became heathen also. Then I became that much more interested in in mythology because I was having experiences that were outside of the Christian framework and I needed the context to kind of make sense of what was happening in my life. So that is kind of the journey. It's a really strange journey. I don't, I don't know how it happened, but I got here (laughs) and I'm really happy that I did. Though you haven't quite worked out the degree of Oak you need in your mead, but once you've got that down, you will (laughs) be That's right. Yes. (laughs) I have never contemplated the oaking or lack thereof of Norse mead before. <laughs> yeah, I really wonder what they I did use in barrels. It must have been barrels. Iceland or Greenland. Oh yeah, I had no yeah, wood. In Iceland. wood. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Maybe they brought their barrels okay. with them. Put a pin yeah. in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they might have, but then they would have been. I mean, pretty high. Something expense. to think about. Mm-hmm. I'll put that on the list of things to try to figure out. Beers for alcohol has become one of my niche <laughs> subjects <laughs> after trying to figure out whether beer would be carbonated or not in the ancient world. <laughs> so mm. still working on that one. Let me know when you find out. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. That's why uh, Vinland was so attractive because there were right. so many trees. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that is true. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. Grapes, schmapes. Let's yeah. talk about the trees. trees yeah. <laughs> Truly. Did you want to ask about the Freitas? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, so I'm, I'm very early on in that book. Oh. So, uh, no spoilers. <laughs> okay. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, this is Daughter of a Thousand Years. Yes. Daughter of a Thousand Years. Yeah. But, you know, it, it just strikes me that that character is, you know, one of the really memorable bits from the mm-hmm. Vinland sagas. Mm-hmm. 
And that is who you 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 based her on the woman who's in the Vinland that yes. who, who who was in Vinland. That is yep. Eric the Red's daughter. Eric the Red's daughter, yes. And I think that's that's a a really cool bit of history to uh, particularly now mm-hmm. thinking about uh you know contact with First Nations people in North America and the problems that scholars have had, at least in Canadian scholars have had in researching this topic, you know, there's been a certain amount of suppression of, of some of this research uh, hmm. in, in the last decade or so. Like, ha- how do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all a little murky and not very well publicly known. Uh-huh. But with the previous federal government... Conservatives. Um, the conservative government, they cut basically someone who is like the expert in in looking into uh, Norse contact in uh, Canada uh, was let go or fired. It, I, I'm not exactly sure what the exact circumstances were, hmm. um, but uh, her, you know, she her was funding was cut. Her funding certainly. was cut, yeah. basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of a move towards, you know, the later nation building Mm -hmm. european nation building in canada and to move away from Mm. uh those early contacts Mm -hmm. that government was very invested in they spent a lot of money on the centenary of the 1812 war for instance Mm. uh the war of 1812 the one that you know we won uh (laughs) according to our stories um speaking of there were versions of history, um, <laughs> uh, but like there was a huge amount. There were all these ads, and the government was very big on like, oh, that was when Canada became a nation, and and there was a lot of this myth building going on. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, they changed our Museum of Civilization to the Museum of History, and they removed all the indigenous stuff. Not all the indigenous. That's not true. But they removed some of the Viking and indigenous stuff from that, and replaced it with more World War Two stuff. And World War One, you know, this there was a sort of a move towards that kind of history mm-hmm. version of history. If it didn't have a war in it, it wasn't important, right? So, I don't, so when Mark says suppression, I think that might be make it sound a little more sinister than it was. It yeah. wasn't. It well, wasn't people coming along and being like, right. "Let's hide all the evidence." There were ever Vikings, yeah, right. but it you know, sort of felt like it though. No, I, I think <laughs> it probably felt like it to yeah. her. Yeah. But it did. It was a matter of saying, like, this isn't an important story. We don't care about this one. We're not going to work on it hmm. anymore. Interesting was, and yeah, sad. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's all all to do with the. Um, all I can think of is Vinland. There's another name for it. Lanso Meadows. Lanso yeah. Meadows. Thank yeah. you. In Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is the site. Yes. Probably. Well, certainly a site certainly of, of Vikings. Yeah. Whether of, it's the site yeah. talked about in the saga is unclear. Yes. I don't know if we'll ever able to pinpoint it to that point probably not no (laughs) (laughs) um you know that when we were in iceland we went to the saga museum yeah and they have these like figures of uh that you go around with um audio an audio guide and it tells you about the very it sort of recounts bits and and element summaries of the various sagas of the icelanders Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's these Pictures, oh, not pictures, um, uh, silicone dummies, yeah. like dressed up <laughs> okay. in, as as the figures from the sagas. And I'm and, right. And Freda was there. She yeah. was depicted in. in yeah. The, so they had that so. story of her with her opening her her dress to um, slap show her off her blade against her. Yeah, to slap her breast and yeah. scare them off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm just, I, I, I'll see if I can, if I, if I can't remember if I took a picture of it or not, I took a picture of a lot of them. They were quite amazing. Um, but if I did, I will put it up in the show notes for this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you'll, I'm not sure you're going to be impressed with the way she's depicted necessarily. <laughs> but she was certainly striking. <laughs> oh, Freitas. Um, Yeah. She was um she was frightening. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, <laughs> she was trying to be frightening. <laughs> exactly. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I really liked the museum. Oh, the the other thing about that museum, they were all just you know still pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, not uh, image, not images. Tableaus, one of them, tableaus yeah. yeah. Like, except one of them had Snorri, 
Uh-huh. Snorri Sturluson. Mm-hmm. In fact, like four versions of him yes. of in course. the same tableau because he's so important. Yes. <laughs> but as you watched it, I'm standing there looking at it. One of them, he was Snorri reciting a poem, I think. His chest moved. What? He was breathing. It was an animatronic <laughs> of him breathing. <laughs> and it was the only one. It was the only one in the entire museum wow. that was, that was exactly moving in any way. Yeah. And it was only in a sort of, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't like mo- making broad gestures. Yeah, right. so it wasn't obvious that he was. That's. And it was the freakiest <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. I just sat there going, oh, my God, this is horrifying. <laughs> Why have they done this? Yeah. But yeah. So that was that was the experience. That would have been <laughs> incredibly startling. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, and I don't know what that was like, why they were trying to do that. And then they also had outside of the exhibit, there was a little um, movie just behind. So they had some clothes set up so you could try on the clothes. Of, oh, that's fun. Of Icelanders, which was fun. And Mark put on a chainmail shirt that nearly killed him. <laughs> <laughs> But just beyond it, there was a tiny little, like a screen and some seats, and they were showing on a loop a movie of them making these uh, silicone figures. And there was a person sitting and watching the movie with headphones on, except it wasn't a person. Oh no! It was a another, another one of silicone. These figures. <laughs> <laughs> but it totally like I completely thought it was I mean I wasn't looking closely because right. you're not paying attention but right. I totally thought it was until uh, Edmund walked up to it and was like and poked it and I looked at him and I'm like why are you poking that person don't poke that person what are you doing and then yeah so it was um, it was quite the museum that <laughs> gonna say. sounds so incredible so when you go to Iceland you have to go to the Saga Museum you I are will. going to go to Iceland right? absolutely yeah yeah no I like I have like I have it all ready to go like um, <laughs> except that I haven't been able to go so <laughs> yeah. I mean I totally understand it's not like I, we haven't wanted to go for years and years and years I and to go for 20 years but, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> so this was when we finally got to go but um, yeah it was quite oh I'm like okay I finally found the images I'm trying oh there she is yes all right <laughs> <laughs> she's trying to cut one of her oh yeah you're not gonna like this this depiction of her <laughs> well um, i mean she's a difficult woman to yeah. like i think <laughs> i mean she like in 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 the stories themselves in the mm. vinland sagas she's she's a very difficult woman mm. mm-hmm. so because of course she's the foil to gudrun so you you you're not really supposed to i think like her very much she's the woman who isn't pious isn't following the sort of rules she, rules right. the way she's supposed to yeah right of course there's yeah there's that whole christian mm-hmm. non-christian problem mm-hmm. which is what you're exploring in the book of course yes, yes. in your parallel narratives <laughs> yes yeah that <laughs> book i I was not ready to write that book. <laughs> <laughs> I actually yeah, it's been a particularly personal one. For, um, it for was very personal, and I knew that it was going to be very personal from from the moment that I started writing it. But I didn't. I I don't think I really realized how unprepared I was. No, I mm-hmm. knew how unprepared I was. <laughs> but I like, and I thought I did a really good job writing it, and and now I'm looking back at it, and just like I actually just wrote a blog post about this that's going to go live tomorrow, which will be probably two weeks ago for listeners, <laughs> um, about how I realize now that I had I really pulled my punches with that book, and I was very afraid of being honest. Uh in the in the present timeline, it was easier for me to be honest Talking about, about Freitas yeah. in in the past, but it was difficult for me to be truthful in the present. So that was it's it's a learning process writing mm-hmm. books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can totally see that. It's a very different thing writing that 
kind of a story where, I mean, obviously your modern character was not you, but obviously was going through many things that you have gone through. Yes. Um, very different than writing something about Helen of Troy. Right. No matter how um, emotionally connected you may feel yourself to her, she lives in a completely different yes. context and world, and you're not giving something away about yourself the same way. And and not only that, but there's there's allowances made for people in the past that we don't make for people in the present. Mm. Mm. So I think that there right. it's easier to be truthful when you're writing in the past than it is to be mm. truthful writing in the present. Because if you are truthful writing in the present, there are going to be far more people who are going to point at it and tell you it's false. Mm. Right. Right. People can sort of judge it against their own. Right. And, and are more inclined to judge against their own personal experience, the present versus the past, which I think that on some level we are all able to realize, well, the past is the past and those people were Mm -hmm. not the, not the same as me. So I can allow that they might have had experiences that I think are unreal. Yeah. No, I can see that. So, well, so are you going to, uh, what do you think? Are you going to revise it or are you going to write a sequel? Uh, I probably will not do either. <laughs> I think that I think that in my writing, I, I do do a lot of exploring our relationship to the divine, um, generally. Like people, mm-hmm. the, the relationship of humanity to the divine. Whether people believe in the divine or not, I feel like there's still, there's still a relationship um, whether that's a relationship of rejection or a relationship of not having a connection because there's, mm-hmm. which I think is totally valid. And like, I think some people don't have any kind of connection. Obviously as someone who does have a connection, I, I am inclined to think there is a divine something because I am, what am I doing if I'm not, if there isn't, then I'm just deluded. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, and I think that we like this is something that has come with us through the past into the present. Everything, especially in today's world, there's a very uh, in the United States there's a fixation on our relationship to the, to the divine, mm-hmm. and and that yeah. relationship being used to further agendas. So I think that it's very important. I, I think it's more important maybe than ever to be writing stories talking about this. But what will probably happen is I will write some totally other story and it'll end up dealing with the same <laughs> themes because right, I right. can't let them go. Haven't said everything <laughs> I want to say, I guess. Yeah. That, that brings up an interesting point that, I mean, you know, the relationship with the divine is very different in... Norse culture to the culture in, in Greece. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- which do you find easier to approach? I don't, I don't know. I think the, I have a harder time separating my own personal experiences from, from mm. the texts or, or the history of Norse, the Norse people. So it's probably easier mm-hmm. for me to approach. It's probably easier for me in ancient Greece and ancient Rome to wrap my like to be objective. I I think. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Right. I and I think that that's, but I feel more connected to the Norse traditions. So it's it's hard to it's hard to. I think they're both. I I don't know. It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a follow-up yes. to that, which is sounds like it's unconnected, but is that is that part of why, or is it really just mostly about marketing that you write with two names? Um, I write with two names because I originally published as Amalia Dillon, and my books didn't make really great sales numbers. So mm-hmm. when I found my agent and she had Helen of Sparta and that was going to be the book that she marketed or pitched for me, mm-hmm. she wanted me to start with a clean slate. 
Um, so it really doesn't have anything uh, okay. to do with anything else besides that. And initially right. I thought that my Amalia Carousel works would stay in the Bronze Age um, and be mm-hmm. just Greek and, you know, that would be what I did there. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, the market changed. And when the market changed and ancient history was out. Hmm. Oh, is it? Yeah. See, I don't know. (laughs) Apparently, apparently it went out sometime right after Helen of Sparta and before by Helen's hand. So, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because Helen of Sparta did quite well. Yes, Helen of Sparta did. Yeah, Yeah, it did do. It was number three in the Kindle store on Amazon. So that was great. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, by Helen's hand did not perform adequately. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) then they said to me, I still had a book on, I still had a book under contract and it was a nebulous unnamed title. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, we'd really like you to do something (laughs) in a different period. And what they really wanted me to do was World War II which, <laughs> of course, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't. I'm sure you could do anything you put your hand to if you needed to. Not but. an area in which yeah. I have a lot of um, mm. interest, I mm-hmm. guess, or actually, like even education. Mm. I like I was I had a classics degree. I I didn't take history classes that had anything to do be with anything beyond the early modern period. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I back okay, and forth I mean, with them. Throw some bombs in yeah. there. All the time. Yeah. A couple of Nazis, you know. <laughs> so oh, <laughs> I was, I was like, well, what can I do? That's not world war two. And they were like, well, <laughs> so I kept pitching them yeah. ideas. I originally wanted to write a book about Charlemagne's first wife. Because she was pagan, yeah. and I thought that would be a really interesting story mm-hmm. to talk about the wife that Charlemagne yeah. mm-hmm. like, Clash of like snubbed yeah. to marry some other woman and um, mm-hmm. make him kind of a villain because I feel like he gets the hero treatment a lot. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure he deserves it. So, <laughs> uh, but that was vetoed. So, <laughs> so I ended up, I said, okay, look. I can do Norse stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> can you let me do Norse stuff at least? That's like a thousand years later. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> We're married. <laughs> <old, right? laughs> and, and they agreed if I did it as a dual narrative. So that's, that's how I ended right. up there. And I was right. thinking to myself the whole time, I was like, this feels like an Amalia Dillon book. This feels like I'm like muddying my brand. Right. What am I doing? But, you know, the contract was the contract and you write the book that you have to write. So Mm -hmm. I wrote it as Amalia Caracella. And now I have two pen names for no real reason. (laughs) 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 Oh, well, they'll... Over time, at the end of your at the end of your writing career, you can look back and and people will come up with all the very very meaningful reasons why each right. book was written under each pen name and how they have to do with thematic right. continuity and. Well, now I'm in know, a fix, <laughs> actually, approach. because I have a book about Pirithus from um, the same Pirithus who's in Helen of Sparta and Tamer of Horses, set in the modern world where he's basically released from Hades. After you know, from the chair of forgetfulness, after thousands of years, it does. But does he? Does he have their own hits, though? <laughs> that's the important question. <laughs> because. We all know that that's why Athenians right. have narrow hips. It's because when Heracles ripped Theseus from the chair in Hades that he was stuck to, he uh, left part of his bum behind. And so Athenians have narrow hips. <laughs> so he was actually released, love not it. torn. So, <laughs> all right. so he we, got to so keep his body it, intact. You're saying. Okay. okay. I, I need to know. <laughs> but now I don't know how to publish it or what name to publish it under because it's obviously too fan like it's obviously fantasy not right. historical just, fiction yeah, yeah. but he himself is a historical figure who is established in my historical novels so i don't so it's it's a it's a conundrum uh, maybe yeah. a third name yeah <laughs> well I, I probably will already have to do that so <laughs> it's already 
probably on the horizon. Sorry. <laughs> Goodness, I think that having multiple Ooh. Twitter accounts is hard. <laughs> Not good at that either. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Oh, these are the complications of modern life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Publishing, too. Mm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. No, I know that there's a there's writing and there's publishing, and obviously they are in, deeply interconnected, but they are not the same thing. Definitely not. No, definitely not. Two more things. One is I don't know if you have Twitter available to you, but I sent you a picture of Freitas. Okay. As a DM, if you want to see what they how they portrayed. Her. Okay, I will open it up and see what I can see. <laughs> because I want to know. I want to hear your reaction. <laughs> I to I want to know. I'm really eager to see what this is, what we have in this. Later on, I, at some other time, I can sh- send you some of the other pic- figures just because I think you'll find them interesting. But I think. All right, what do we have? Oh, Freitas. Oh. Okay. Well, that's not how I imagined it exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like they made her into a, like a, a witch. Like, doesn't she look kind of witchy? Yeah. Now, to be fair, they all kind of did. They d- definitely. Said they all for, kind of look witchy. <laughs> they all they definitely went for the sort of lank hair and you know mm-hmm. slightly raggedy um, apparel. Though not all of the figures, but but a certain certain number of them were. But yes, her face is kind of terrifying. I think. Yeah. 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 Oh, poor Freitas. So, Yes, I will put this in the show notes, but I want everyone to know that this is not the Freitas of... (laughs) 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 Hey, I leave that up to my readers to decide. (laughs) They would like to picture her that way. That's up to them. She's a difficult figure, but I I can't say that that was exactly the image that you you conjured in my mind. (laughs) 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 So anyway, um, (laughs) then I have... One more very important question. Okay. Which is, are you ever going to get yourself some goats? Oh, I really want to. (laughs) This has been an ongoing, I have wanted goats forever, forever. So (laughs) um, I was, I was going to get them when we moved to where we live now, because it's, we have 80 acres uh, on this plot and mm-hmm. not all of it is cleared a lot of it is wooded but I couldn't and then like my family it's like a this house that I live in is it was my grandfather's house and so the family is very invested in this mm-hmm. house and everything that goes on in it and on the grounds mm-hmm. so there's a little bit of pushback and also it's owned by my sister so she obviously gets veto power over livestock <laughs> and um so there was there was not a lot of family relationships are complicated <laughs> for the goat plan uh and Aww. now and now i am not sure to goats what's and... gonna happen <laughs> well like there's cows down the road and they're beautiful they're beautiful cows mm. they're highland cattle down the road and uh, sometimes oh, i wow. dream That's of awesome. having a highland cow also Mm -hmm. someday yes someday i will have goats but not in the nearest future (laughs) that's a lot of work i'm not sure yeah well i mean i i understand (laughs) i I mean i don't want to have a goat i want you to have i i I feel like they would do such a good job at mowing the lawn and right now i have to pay my cousin to do that that is i want to borrow someone's goat yes which obviously wouldn't work i could borrow yours but i want to borrow a goat because our we've got a big backyard and um it's currently i i didn't quite mow it in time before it got too Mm -hmm. cold and i don't know if i'm going to get to it and i normally leave half of it unmown entirely Mm -hmm. and i never got to cutting it down so it's basically a wilderness yes and a goat would do wonders. A goat would. That's <laughs> like two days it would take it. Really, down. the dream is yes, yes. just to have mm-hmm. the goat for like landscaping purposes would be incredible. But yeah. we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll have okay, to work well, on fine. people a little bit longer. <laughs> but someday, yeah. And I'm going to name them Masher and Blender. I'll get two. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> of course. <laughs> Just make sure one of them isn't slightly lame. Or maybe get one that's slightly yeah. lame. Yeah. Either way. Maybe. <laughs> and I wonder, I really wonder if if that goat was lame for 
like multiple reanimations, or if he like was it forever? Did yeah. the goat heal after a couple of? Yeah, that's a good question. Like I don't the think next it's ever time. Mentioned. <laughs> well, I mean, if I suppose if the boats, if boats, if. If the bones, <laughs> if the we'll bones crack the next were cracked, well, but 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 the bones are always the same, right? Because you never, the bones uh, are never reconstituted. Yeah. It's always the he bones. Saves yeah. the bones and then the, the goat this is quite possibly a very incomprehensible uh, <laughs> conversation to those who don't know this story. Maybe I should just Mark, would you like to very briefly tell the story? It's <laughs> the very beginning kid, part of um, <laughs> the adventure of, of Thor going to visit. Uh, the giant uh, Utgard mm-hmm. Loki. And uh, at the very beginning, he meets this family of f- farmers and he, you know, he says he'll, he'll share his food with them. And he, you know, takes his goat and he slaughters it. And the goats it that care that pull his, his chariot, his chariot, his chariot by the way. Yes. He doesn't just wander around. <laughs> the goats, so, I mean, yes. he so, so these are magical yes. goats. Mm-hmm. And he says, and he takes the skin and lays it out. And he says, uh, just leave the bones on top of the skin uh, and eat eat whatever you eat want, what, what but you just want. don't eat the bones. Yeah. And leave the bones on top of the skin. And what happens is the next day, the goat comes back to life from the bones and the skin. But because the uh, the young boy, Thialfi, um, cracked one of the bones to get at the marrow mm-hmm. inside, when the goat came to life again, its leg was crooked. Mm-hmm. And then he makes Thialfi into his slave. Yes, and so, well, it's it's not exactly a slave. It, they come to an agreement. He, I mean, they're poor bond. farmers. He's a bond servant. He's a bond which servant. Is, yes, Him and his yeah. sister. But he gets. To, uh, we cannot forget his sister. And his sister, yeah, who never gets mentioned again. No. Like Thialfi gets to do one of the contests, right. but she never gets. But she to do goes a contest with them. They get to. Garbo. She goes with them. She goes. But she with doesn't them. do a contest. She does. No, and that that always kind of irritated yeah. me that she never got to but she contest. got to go it, with it them at least from... yes, yes she, that yeah. is true and so yeah they have a, a life of adventure so mm-hmm. you know it's better than living a, a poor farmer's a starving life i suppose but, life, uh, yeah. yeah 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 no true it's it's sort of a back and forth then you haven't read the postcards from asgard no I haven't. Uh, by amalia so yes in which this is in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, via the yes of goats. <laughs> 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 Right. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just I felt like if we were just talking about <laughs> random goats and reconstituting them from bones, it was going to be very complicated yeah. for people. It's one thing to mention Theseus and yeah. passing, but <laughs> I don't think these no. are well known. No, they're not. No. And I was actually really mad because the Ted Ed did an animation uh, telling this story of Thor's adventure and mm. Galfi and Loki. And they removed Ruskva completely from the story. Like they, mm, yeah. like she wasn't even because. mentioned, and I was like, "What? What are you doing? Like here we have one peasant girl. <laughs> like this is like, yep. but we've yeah, yeah, she's got mentioned. a name, yeah, yeah. my name, you know, last, and yeah. you just yeah. erased her completely from her own adventure. So rude." Mm-hmm. <sighs> <laughs> yep. Well, as an example of retelling myth to fit the context of the well, tellers. Hmm. Who do we care about? It's yeah. I was very angry. It's telling. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about when people retell myth. The things they tell and the things they leave out mm-hmm. are yes. extremely indicative yeah, of right. what yes. they value and what yep. they don't. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that's interesting, and also yeah. aggravating. No, I definitely <laughs> had like I'm still not over that. So, <laughs> like every once in a while, I still break it out again to my husband, and I'm like, I can't believe they what. <sighs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is something that comes up with frequency in our house <laughs> uh these are the things that keep america yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the utterly petty and niche <laughs> irritations that you just cannot help yourself from talking about yes yeah. well to be fair he has a lot of petty and niche irritations in relation to aviation so I think right. that Fine. it's a fair, fair trade of, you know, <laughs> interest. Well, I think um, uh, on that note, we will <laughs> of uh, irritating. Uh, but we'll we'll call a close for tonight, though. It, I, we could, you know, there's, there's things we haven't even talked about orcs. No, but whatever. <laughs> we'll leave the orcs for another day. Okay. 
But if you like orcs, people, you can also read her orc book. Honor Among Orcs so, is the first one. Yes, yes. And of course, I will be putting links to all of your book. Well, to a link to both of your okay. websites, <laughs> your, your two personae, <laughs> and um, the books we've talked about and things, so that people can fi- find all of these things. They're all available on Kindle. And Mark is specifically listening right. to um, Daughter of a Thousand Years. Oh, that. Because it's available, it's available on, on Audible. That audio is awesome. I love the narrator. Yeah. Personal endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I just think it's really cool to be on Audible. I mean, I think yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So I strongly recommend that if any of this sounded interesting to you, fair listeners, feel uh, you should check it all out. And thank you so much for joining us and for talking to us tonight. It was my pleasure. Was true pleasure. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much for inviting me. <laughs> and it was great because we've talked, as I was saying before we started recording, we've spoken digitally for years. Yeah. I don't know how many years now <laughs> um, since we first um, came in contact. But this is the first time we've spoken. Well, we're still not in the same yeah. room. But, <laughs> One thing at a time. <laughs> Small step. Um, but lovely to actually speak with you. Yeah, you also. Both of you. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.